have a good time. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning and you would open them to Luke chapter 8, New Testament, third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 8, beginning at verse 40. It's a long chapter. We're going to read through verse 56. Luke chapter 8, verse 40, standing in honor of the reading of God's Word, the Word of the Lord reads in this fashion in the King James text, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was the ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman, having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her blood issue staunched or stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not his, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people, for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, and took her by the hand, and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway. And he commanded to give her meat, and her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. I want to talk to us for a little while this morning on the topic of no trouble at all. You'll notice in our story that the Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, his servant came to him and said, Your daughter's dead. Trouble not the master. But Jesus, in a sense, turned to him and said, Jairus, it's no trouble at all. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you this morning. No trouble at all. Master, we thank you, God, for your word, for it's exalted above all else this hour. We ask God today that you would anoint your servant, God, that we might be able to deliver a word that could encourage the hearts of the hearer. God, we're in a difficult time in human history, headed for even more difficult waters. We need strength at this hour, God. We need our hearts to be lifted up. We need our spirits, God, to be raised to heavenly places with the Lord. Master, let the word of God go forth this hour with boldness and great power. Let it not be, God, with enticing words of man's wisdom, but rather in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. For we ask it in none other than the wonderful, lovely name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Sometimes you feel like you really put somebody out. Sometimes you have, you have to ask somebody for a favor. And you feel like you're really putting them out. You know, you really feel like they're having to go quite a bit out of their way to help you. 
and a lot of times we'll even apologize to our friends or to our family members. Gee, I'm so sorry I had to ask you to help me to move. I'm so sorry I had to ask you to help me to do this. Or I'm so sorry that I had to bother you to help me to do that. And we'll respond or they'll respond to us by saying, really, it's no trouble. Amen. You ever had your friends or your family or somebody say, oh, it's no trouble at all. It's okay. That's their way of letting you know it's really not a bother. I don't mind doing this for you. Jairus had come to Jesus because his daughter was very ill. It's amazing how the very ones who gave the Lord the most trouble, which were the rulers of the synagogue, <laughs> when they have a need big enough and they can't do anything about it themselves, it's amazing how they'll get over their trouble with you to ask you for help. I remember I had a friend in New York City some years ago whose name was Fabian. He's a young African-American man, beautiful kid to look at, very attractive young man. And Fabian told me one time, he said, Charles, I love you as a friend, and I respect you, and I admire you. He said, but I'm not a church-going person. I really don't care about all that God stuff and all that Jesus stuff. He said, just not for me. He said, so I can't say that I would ever come to your church. And I said, well, Fabian, that's okay. I said, we don't chain people up and drag them to church. I said, if you want to come, you're welcome to come. If you don't want to come, you don't have to come. About two weeks later, I got a telephone call from Fabian. And he's in tears. And I said, Fabian, what's wrong? I thought for sure somebody had died, a family member or something. He said, Charles, my best friend... She's an African-American girl, and she's only 28 years old, and it turns out that she has AIDS, and we didn't know it. Said she's had HIV for a number of years, but she never told any of her family. She never told any of her friends. She was too embarrassed. She hasn't been going to a doctor. She hasn't been getting any kind of treatment whatsoever. And now she's in the hospital She's got some sort of an infection. The doctors can't isolate it. They can't figure out what it is she's got. She's down to 98 pounds. Her skin is ashen. It's gray. The doctors are saying she's got 24 to 48 hours to live. She has one T-cell. That's what her T-cell count was, one. And I said, okay, well, maybe, and I'm just I'm, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What do you want me to do? Well, I remember you're talking to me about how much you believe that God is the God of miracles and how God can perform miracles and how God can heal people. And I said, yes, sir, I sure do believe that. He said, well, I thought maybe you could just come to the hospital and pray for her. And I said, well, yes, I can do that. I'd be happy to do that. He said, but you need to get her family or her, somebody, to agree for me to do that. I can't just do it to be doing it. I said, I need for them to be willing for me to come. And I'm going to shorten this story quite a bit, okay? I went to the hospital that afternoon after church because it was on a Sunday morning that he called me. We prayed for this young lady in the morning service. This is when I was in New York City. We prayed for that young lady in the morning service. I went to see her that afternoon. I had never seen anybody look as bad as this girl looked. She was in horrible, hideous condition. She was on intravenous feeding because she couldn't eat anything by mouth. She couldn't keep anything down. She'd lost so much weight, she looked like skin stretched over a skeleton. You know how that is. Her skin was gray, literally gray. This is a black girl, but her skin was gray, about the color of Tommy's shirt, kind of. She looked terrible. Her family had all come from the great state of Texas. They were all from the Skeet, actually. And they had flown up. Eight members of her family had flown up north to be with her in her last moments. And I went in and I spoke with the family for 
couple of hours trying to encourage them to believe God for a miracle because God's a miracle working God. And I told the mother, I said, I am a Pentecostal preacher. She said, oh, praise God, I'm Pentecostal. And I said, well, honey, then you know that there ain't no sense giving up till God's done. Amen? I said, it ain't over till it's over. She said, no, sir, I'm with you. So we got around her bed, all eight members of the family and Fabian, got around her bed in a semicircle, and they held hands. And I was standing at the head of the bed, and I took out my anointing oil. And I anointed her with oil, and I laid my hands on her and prayed for her. And I said, now you're going to be all right. She could not stay awake for more than five minutes at a time. And anybody who knows anything about the death and dying process knows that when a person is very, very close to death, they frequently sleep. They, they keep going to sleep because their body cannot, it just doesn't have the energy, it doesn't have the ability to stay awake. That's more than they're able to do. So as a person gets closer and closer to dying, they tend to keep dropping into sleep constantly. And that's what she was doing. This girl was very close to her death. The next morning, that girl woke up. God had touched her so miraculously that she sat up in her bed and said to her mother, Mother, I am hungry. I want some food. And her mother told me later, she said, we brought her in McDonald's, we brought her in fruit, we brought her in pizza, we brought her in the hospital food, said everything we put in front of her, she ate it up like a vacuum, just ate it up, said the doctor came in that afternoon and said, what in the world's going on? The mother said, the preacher's here yesterday to pray for her, and she woke up this morning hungry. He said, well... I can't tell you what's happened. He said, but if she gets her strength back and if she continues to improve, he said, by Friday, I'll let her go home. Well, she went home all right, and she came back here to Texas. And a month or so later, she called me. And she said, Pastor Morrow, my mother said that she received a note from you wanting to know how I was doing, make sure I was okay. She said, well, I wanted to call and tell you I've enrolled in school down here. I've got a job down here. She said, my viral load is undetectable, and my T cells are over 800. The doctor said this is impossible because this simply cannot be. It doesn't work this way. Even people on medication cannot improve like this. She said, uh, but my mom wanted me to call and tell you. And I said, praise God. And I reminded her, I said, honey, just do me one favor. Don't forget that God did this for you. Amen. Never forget that God did this thing for you. And never forget to give him the glory. You see, Jairus is a lot like my friend, Fabian. He didn't have much use for Jesus until he needed Jesus. Amen. Fabian didn't have much use for me as a preacher until he needed a preacher who could pray the prayer of faith. But when Jairus needed Jesus, he came to Jesus and he humbled himself before the Lord and besought him that the Lord might come and help his daughter. Now, as they were en route to the Lord's house, I mean, excuse me, to Jairus' house, the Lord was sidetracked by another individual who had a great need, who had pressed in through the multitude and through the crowd and had obtained her miracle by merely touching the hem of the Master's garment. And by the time all the commotion had come to a boil, and by the time the Lord had finally discovered who had done what and why it was that he had felt virtue go out of him, all of a sudden, Enough time had passed so that Jairus' daughter was now passed on. She had died. And here come one of the servants from Jairus' house to tell him, in verse 49, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only. And she will be made whole. I like to 
just kind of paraphrase that a little bit this morning. And the Lord just turned to him and said, Jeff, it's still no trouble at all. Amen. It's no trouble at all for me to still come to your house. You see, the problem is, sometimes we get it in our mind, just when God can do something, and when it's beyond His ability to do something. But the reality is, it is never beyond God's ability to do something. Amen. No matter how bad our situation looks, no matter how dire our situation becomes, no matter how uh, difficult things may be, God is still in a position to do what needs to be done. You see, not only can my Jesus heal the sick, he can raise the dead if necessary. So it doesn't matter if Jared's daughter was sick, laying, dying, or whether she was dead. In either situation, Jesus is able to do what needs to be done. Praise God. Amen. I want you to know today, children, our God is not offended by our faith. I don't care if you're straight, gay, black, or white. Cross-eyed ugly. It doesn't matter. God is not offended by faith. God, every time we come to Him in faith and we ask Him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, the, the Father is well pleased in us. I want you to know God enjoys being our Heavenly Father. Amen. I remember... This may be an unusual reference to use in a message, but I remember watching an episode of Roseanne. I've seen the same episode many times, of course. And uh, in this one particular episode, Darlene was off at school, and she had gotten a job offer with a company where she'd be making starting out at like $30,000. And she didn't take the job because she wanted to finish school. And Roseanne and Dan and everybody in the family was looking at her like she was crazy. To get a job that starts at $30,000, you know, Dan and Roseanne worked all their lives to try to get up to a job that paid $30,000. And here Darlene was handed a job that started at $30,000. And they could not for the life of them understand why she would pass that up. She said, I want to finish school. Once I finish school, there will be other job offers that will come, and I'll make that much and more. But I want to finish school first. Well, they couldn't understand that. But at one point in the episode, Roseanne had to come to Dan and say to him, Dan, I know you can't understand why Darling made the decision she, she made, but you know what? The bottom line is this. She's still your daughter, and she still needs us. And she still needs the $100 you were going to give her to go back to school with. And Dan says, oh, so I suppose you're telling me this so I can go up there and be the big dad, and that's going to make me feel good to give her the $100 to go back to school with, right? And Roseanne says, right. And he says, okay. And he bounces up to the room. Why? Because Dan enjoys being a father. He likes having a daughter that needs him. He enjoys doing for her when she needs him to do for her. I want you to know that there's a bounce in God's step when you need something done that you can't do for yourself. And you turn to God and you say, Lord... Can you do this for me, please? I want you to know God is well pleased because God enjoys being our Heavenly Father. He likes doing for us. He likes being able to help us when we are not able to help ourselves. There's a parable that the Lord spoke in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, and He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men are always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, 
Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. You'll notice in that entire parable, the Lord is incur he's using this parable to encourage people to pray and not to faint. In other words, if you don't get the answer today, then ask again tomorrow. If the answer don't come tomorrow, then ask again on Tuesday. If the answer don't come on Tuesday, then ask again on Wednesday. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop believing God. Don't stop exercising your faith. Keep on keeping on until the answer comes. That's what this parable was meant to illustrate. And yet the Lord ends his statements by saying, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Because the bottom line in all of this is faith. At the bottom of all this, the truth of the matter is faith. You see, there's no sense asking if you're not first believing. It would have been foolish for Jairus to have come to the Lord and asked him, can you come help my daughter, if he didn't believe that Jesus could help his daughter. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It would have been foolish for Jairus to have gone to Jesus if he didn't believe Jesus could do something for her. And I'm here to tell you today, children, if all we're doing is flapping our lips in prayer, but we're not believing God is able, but not only is God able, but believing that God is willing. That's one of the things. I've been preaching this for so many years now. I remember preaching this in church after church after church. Now, now I don't mean message-wise, but I'm talking about the content. Not only is God able, but He's willing. How many times in the Scriptures do you read the Bible said someone would come to Jesus and say, Lord, if you're willing, I could be made whole. <laughs> if you're willing, my leprosy could be cleansed. If you're willing, my blind eyes could see. And every single time, Jesus would answer by saying, I will, hallelujah, be thou made whole. Glory to God. Because God is not only able to meet our needs, God is not only able to perform the miracle, God is not able, uh, not only able to do that which we need, but He's willing to do it if you'll just give it to Him in faith. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. I got some folks in church and in family always wondering why God don't seem to answer their prayer. I'll tell you why. Because they're not asking in faith. Oh, boy, that's kind of hard, isn't it? No, it's true. There's a huge difference between asking in fear and asking in faith. There's a huge difference between being the men on the boat as the storm is raging high who cry out and say, Lord, don't you care that I perish? Now, what kind of a faith-filled prayer was that. Lord, don't you care that I can't pay my bill? Lord, don't you care that I don't have enough money to, to meet my expenses? Lord, honey, that ain't a faith prayer. Come on now. You hear what I'm telling you? And then we wonder why God ain't doing nothing. Well, because you're not, you're not coming to Him in faith. You're not coming to Him as your Heavenly Father. You're not approaching Him as a benevolent God who wants to help you. You're coming to Him in a panic. And all that's motivating you is fear and not faith. 
Sometimes the way in which the Lord answers prayer is not the way we expect the answer to come. We pray for a better job so we can make more money. So what does the Lord do? He sends us overtime. The Lord, that's not what I wanted. I don't want overtime. I want a better job. I want a different job where I make more money. But the Lord doesn't give us a better job. He doesn't give us a different job. He gives us overtime. We're still making more money. But that's not what we were praying for. Now listen, God knows good and well, listen to me now, that the more money we make, the deeper the hole we'll dig ourselves into. You hearing me? If I get a job, if I have a job pays 20000 and I dig myself into a hole where I'm, I'm really $30,000 in debt for a $20,000 job, God knows if I give you a $50,000 job, you'll dig a $100,000 hole. So maybe he'll leave you in the $20,000 job so that you don't dig that $100,000 hole. You following my logic? He keeps us at a level where we're able to dig ourselves into so deep a hole that should circumstances change and should situations become difficult, we will not be in a place where we might have to lose everything and start from scratch. Hmm. Never thought of it that way, did you? See, the Lord's keeping you right where he's got you because he knows I can't I can't trust you up here. If I put you up here, you'll dig a hole so deep that if, if you were to lose your job or something happened five years down the road, you'll lose everything. And you'll wind up having to go back to scratch. So wouldn't you just rather be comfortable and happy and stay that way all the way through rather than have all this and then have to go through the process of losing it? Hmm. See, God's a good God. <laughs> He's always looking out for our best interests. Always. He is always looking out for our best, uh, our best interests. Listen this morning. Daniel might have hoped to be spared from the lion's den. But instead of being spared the lion's den, he was put in the den only to find that the lions were hungry. Have you considered the fact today that God hasn't always prevented your having to face your enemies or face your demons? But then when you do face them, you find that he has removed their fangs and filled their tummies so that they are no longer ravenous wild beasts, but now they're nothing more than big plush stuffed animals. Hallelujah. You ever think about that? Lord, don't let me have to do this. Lord, don't let me have to go through this experience. Don't let me have to go through that experience. And the Lord said, no, I want you to go through it. And then when you get in it, all of a sudden, things aren't what you thought they were. And you wind up coming through victorious on the other side because God defanged the lions before you got there. Amen. The three Hebrew children... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that I sung about this morning may have prayed to be kept from the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, but instead God himself met them. God himself met them in that furnace, and they walked out unharmed, having had a face-to-face -face visitation with the Almighty. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to know Daniel 3, 16 through 18, the conviction that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us. <laughs> There's some faith-talking people. He will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, even if he don't, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. 
Boy, there's some faith. There's some boys who know how to have faith in God. Maybe the Lord wants you and I in our current trial. Amen. You hear me this morning. Haven't you ever wondered how it is that the fire you're going through is not so much as singeing your clothes or leaving a smell on your clothes even though you'd much rather be somewhere else? But you know what, Jeff? It ain't killing you. And like the old saying goes, what don't kill you makes you stronger. Amen. Some of the trials we've been through recently, they didn't kill me. I'd rather not have had to go through it, but it didn't kill me. Glory to God. Because God says, no, I want you in the furnace. Because it's in the furnace that you and I are going to have a face-to-face meeting. And we're going to show on Nebuchadnezzar just how deep down and personal this God can get. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory. Immediately after the master calmed the raging sea, he immediately turned to his disciples and rebuked them for their lack of faith. First thing he said after he told the seas to shut up and the winds to calm down, he's pointed this direction. Now shut up, winds. Calm down, seas. Turns around. How can you have so little faith? Because God don't want us approaching him in fear and in terror. He wants us approaching him in faith and confidence. I want you to know God wants us this morning to learn to find comfort in the knowledge, Jeff, that he's riding in our boat with us. We are not alone. He will never leave us nor forsake us. That's the promise of his word. No matter how high the waves or dark the clouds, no matter how loud the thunder or bright the lightning, it behooves us to remember at all times that our God created these elements. They cannot overtake Him, and therefore they cannot overtake us. Hallelujah. If they can't take God down, they can't take you down. Glory to God. No matter how powerful Rome is, it doesn't matter. It can't take God down. And as long as it can't take God down, it can't take us down. It will stand in faith like the three Hebrew children did. Whoo, glory. Well, I hope you're getting something out of this this morning. The children of Israel prayed for meat, and God sent them quail. Maybe they wanted beef. Maybe they wanted lamb. The Lord meets our needs. He doesn't always meet our wants. Amen? Sometimes God gives you what you need, not so much what you want. But that's where the Scripture said, Paul said, I've learned to be content whatsoever state I'm in. As long as my needs are met, I'm happy. I'm all right. I, I, you know, I, I could, I can't even say I'd be happier if I had this, this, and this. No, it might be more convenient for me if I had this, this, and this. But would I really be happier? Because I'll tell you what, if you took my food away, or if you took my roof away, or if you took my house away, honey, then you'd know what unhappiness is. And all of a sudden, you know, when we're so unhappy because we don't have a car, well, I don't have a car. Boy, that makes me miserable. But you know what? You find out when you lose your groceries, find out when you lose your home, that now you know what unhappiness is. You follow what I'm saying? Because while you had your needs met, you were pretty content. My Lord, have mercy. Romans chapter 8 tells us, verses 31 through 39. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Think about it, Jeff. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also 
freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Do not be afraid to trouble the Master with your distress this morning. But be certain that you are approaching him not in terror and fear of destruction, but rather with faith and confidence, knowing that he is going to see you through. Because, Jeff, when we come to the Lord, as the old song used to say, it's me again, Lord. I got a prayer that needs an answer. It's me again, Lord. I've got a problem I can't solve. The Lord responds, It's no trouble at all. Amen. Amen. It's no trouble at all. Would you stand with me this morning? Praise God. And I hope you got something out of that. <sighs> Praise God. It's no trouble at all. Don't mind. It doesn't bother God as long as you approach Him in faith. It doesn't bother Him in the least. If you're going to start screaming at Him out of fear and terror, that's a different story. But so long as you approach Him in faith, He's going to respond. It's no trouble at all. I don't mind doing it for you, Tommy. I don't mind doing it for you, Charles. I don't mind doing it for you, Jeff. It's no trouble at all. Amen. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for the wonderful spirit we felt in this place. The precious presence of a living God. We're grateful, God, for your word, and we ask today, Lord, that you would help to grasp this word to our hearts. Lord, make it a part of us. Help us to live it. Help us, Lord, to approach you not in fear but in faith. Help us, God, to stop screaming at you and to start crying out to you. Master, help us to be a people of faith. You declared while you walk this earth, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith in the earth? God, make us a people of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord, today, make us a people of faith, able to believe you for great things, able to see great things happen, because our confidence and our faith is solely, squarely established in you. Master, help us today, we pray, to walk this walk and talk this talk. Make it an everyday experience, God. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Praise God and amen. God bless you this morning. I thank you for being here. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Go.